So what happens is um, that since, now I lost my train of thought. <laughs> Again, to the flow. Right, so it's, it's like kind of like, well, this is a deep rabbit hole, right? And as you start to unpack this for yourself, it gets really confusing because you find that how you've been unconscious conditioned has actually been racist, right? So, so and, and we really need to understand we really need to understand is that white supremacy has not only been harmful to people of color, but you have to think about, so who, if you look back in history, right, what kind of person was able to engage in slavery and colonization and, and not do anything about it, right? And actually continue to perpetuate it, actively benefit from it, actively spread it, right? And so it's... I'll stop her there since she can't get her train of thought focused there. All right, let's talk about the issue of racism. Now, she's trying to insinuate that racism was only done by white people. Racism... It was, was done, done by every culture. culture. Right. Every culture. The Chinese engaged in slavery. The Japanese engaged in slavery. Um, yes, throughout Europe, it was engaged in. The Romans did it. The Greeks did it. And many places within Africa does it. Still today. I was about to say that there's still slaves in Africa that are owned by other black people. You know, it's not white people who started slavery. But they're the ones who have the you know, worst PR because these feminists are like, well, it's white people that have racism, so... But here's the kicker, is that people in Africa, black people, Africans, like, hey, let's sell our slaves to the Europeans. Let's sell our slaves to the Americans. It was the Africans who were enslaving other Africans and sold them. So don't make it sound like, oh, it's white people perpetuating uh, this white supremacy. Is it white supremacy when a black African enslaves another African and sells it to a white person. Is that white supremacy or is that black supremacy? Because if it wasn't for the blacks, the black Africans doing this, getting slaves would have been a much harder thing to do and most likely would have been enslaving other white people, which was done during this time. There were white slaves. Yeah, yeah the, the Romans, Romans owned white slaves. So, so did the, the Greeks. Greeks. And throughout European history, there were white slaves. They were called serfs. They were called peasants. Yep. yep. They, they were indentured servants. It's like Ireland was literally an entire island of indentured servants. They were owned by the English. But we forget all of this. But here's the other thing, is that they're trying to also insinuate that all white people throughout American history were slave owners. No. They weren't. There, there were actually very few plantations. Really the only places that had slaves were plantations, and there weren't very many of them in America. The thing is, is that only a small percentage of white men actually owned slaves. Yeah, you had to have a lot of money to do that, and there weren't a whole lot of rich people back then. Let's put it this way. For the first election for the President of the United States, George Washington, the only way you could qualify is that yes you had to be white you also had to be a man except in New Jersey you're actually allowed to be a woman and vote and you had to be a landowner and generally the only people who had slaves were landowners 12 percent of the American society at that time voted in the election 12 percent of the society was eligible to vote and, you know, it was Thomas Jefferson who actually wanted to do away with slavery. But, unfortunately, it would have crippled the economy, so they couldn't. And I'm not trying to justify what they were doing. I just understand why they didn't want to end slavery. I don't agree with it. I think slavery is horrible. But I understand why they did it. And throughout American history, at most, only 25% of 
Americans own slaves. Yeah. Another, Another thing, thing is this whole toxic whiteness thing. It, it's basically, basically it, it's it's the profile of an abuser. Your, your mere existence is somehow harming me. The, the fact, fact that you exist and are white, you're harming me. It's kind of like, I hit you, but you made me do it. It's, it's a common theme with abusers. And this is basically just a siren song for other abusers. It's, it's you can be an abuser, but, but as long as you're doing it for the right side. It's, don't worry, the, the reason, reason you're angry is because you're being harmed by it, but if you do it a certain way, it's okay if you abuse people as long as they're the right group. So it's giving license to people who are already abusers to continue being abusers. Well, what it also reminds me of is this um, case, well, this incident that happened at, like, I think it was like Oregon University. But basically, this woman says that she got raped in, like, Florida, and then went to Oregon University, and someone she saw there looked a, her rapist, and so his life got destroyed simply for looking like her rapist. He wasn't there. He had nothing to do with it, but because she had fifis, and that had to be protected at all costs, he couldn't go to some of his classes, you know, he couldn't go to his dorm room, he couldn't go to his job, which was linked to his college courses, so he lost his job, all because of how he looked. <clears throat> so, us being white, you and me, Josh, is harmful to minorities simply because we're white. Yeah. You know, we never oppressed people, and yet we're being judged for our fathers because their fathers or grandfathers or great-grandfathers were once slaves, but they are not slaves now. You know, we've overcome so much, and yet they're living in a past that they were never a part of. Maybe their genetics was, but they themselves are not. And if you want to heal from that, you've got to let go of it. Yes, it's horrible that happens. And we're constantly reminded that this happened. But, you know, you, you I, I hate the whole concept of reparations because all that is is, oh, you enslaved my family, so you need to give me money. You need free stuff. My family, if my family did it, which mine were not slave owners, we were never rich enough, at least on my father's side. I don't know about the other side. Maybe they were. I don't know. But, you know, they were rich. They had money. Why don't you go after them? Oh, wait, they're dead, so you come after me and I have no money? I mean, how does that make sense? I'm, you're probably better off than I am. I think it's very important to, to not entirely demonize people, right? And just be like, oh, they're just terrible, horrible monsters, right? Because they're human beings. And for a lot of folks, they're your ancestors, right? And, and there's all a reason why they did what they did, not that it justified what they did, but, but they, there was something happening, right? Where this, and what they started to do, right? Because I think that human beings are naturally compassionate people, right? So we're naturally compassionate in the presence of pain. We want to do something to alleviate it. And if we do, and if in the presence of pain, we don't want to do anything to, to stop it, right? Then there's something getting in the way, right? And, and I think that, and that leads to emotional deadening, right? So there's an emotional deadening that starts to get experienced for folks who engage in really horrific, atrocious stuff. And, and we know we lately have been learning more and the studies have been had on intergenerational trauma about how genetically trauma is passed down through the generations. Bull fucking shit. They're, they're talking about this, they're, they're talking about this like it's post-traumatic post slave disorder. You're telling me 
that if someone was a slave, they genetically passed down the trauma they experienced being a slave through genetics. Bullshit! That is fucking bullshit! That kind of information is not passed on with genetics! Memory has nothing to do with genetics. There is no memory. There's no memory genetics. That would be kind of cool if there was, you know, but no, that, it doesn't work like that. You don't know anything as a baby that your parents knew. You only know, you know, what they teach you. If it was like that, everyone on Earth would be a genius right now because we would have so much knowledge that had built up throughout the generations and everyone just was just born knowing that we would all be geniuses. And we know that there are not, that everybody is not a bunch of geniuses. There are a lot of idiots in this world. Exactly. I mean, of all the things that we can pass down through genetics, racism is the thing that we do. And yet they'll go and say that, you know, racism is taught and it's the patriarchy that's teaching racism. You know, this white supremacy is a system that was designed to say, we're not racists, but we're going to teach you how to do racist things. Now saying, well, even if you deny that exists, you're racist because your ancestors were racist and it passed down through genetics. And my people built railroads because Chinese built railroads. I don't know if she's actually Chinese, Japanese. I could give a shit, but... She's, she said she's Korean or she says it at some point in the video. But... You know, because racism somehow happened sometime in the entire span of your history, there you go. Well, you know what? My family, my family history, I know all the way back to the 1700s, they were Protestants um, in France in the 1700s during a time where you actually could you know, get arrested for not being Catholic. And so they left to find greener pastures, to go to America, the land of the free, to get away from that. So, because they experience that oppression, religious persecution, does that mean that I'm automatically a victim from religious persecution through my genetics? It's ridiculous. You know, personally for me, you know, I'm Korean American in my family. My grandmother grew up during the Japanese occupation when they colonized us. And so it's interesting that, you know, we didn't really talk about that so much. And yet when, I, when we do talk about it or I do think about it or read about it, it's, I can feel the feelings come forward, right? That wasn't my personal reality. But I do believe that that trauma was passed down to me genetically. Right? And like I said, studies have lately been showing that I'm focusing more on marginalized folks, particularly colonized folks, people gone through um, long periods of interrogation or whatnot. But I think this can really apply to anybody. And you know, if we think about you know, our, our white ancestors or your white ancestors who engage in a lot of these behaviors, these racist, really violent behaviors, how that actually has been passed down in wanting to resist acknowledging that that was happening, that was wrong, right? That was so harmful, right? Okay, so... Oh, this is just so painful. You, you, you're, she's trying to say that, you know, because your white ancestors or, you know, someone else's white ancestors engaged in slave trading that somehow makes you responsible and that even if it wasn't your family directly that was engaged in slave trading because your family was complacent in letting it happen you're responsible even though your family may not have had any control in doing anything about it they allowed it to happen so you're responsible so it's basically guilt by proxy or guilt by association or, I guess in this case, it'll be guilt by genetics of association. I mean, she's basically saying that all white people are responsible for what the activities of a select few engaged in. It's that no matter what, no matter what your family 
was or did in the past, they're still guilty. You're, you're never good, good enough. enough. It's You're somehow inherently flawed no matter what. You can't escape being, having toxic whiteness. You will always be toxic. Which then means that this whole thing on healing from it is a misnomer. You can never heal from it. You can acknowledge it, but you can never escape it. You are bad because you were born white. That is what they're saying. And, and with the fact, fact that they ignore that every race has owned slaves at some point in time, by their own logic, they're just as guilty. But they, they won't acknowledge that. No, because only white people have ever owned slaves. And all of the other races that own slaves, the Mongolians who own slaves, the uh, African tribes or African nations that own slaves, those were volunteers. They weren't actual slaves. They, they, they were unpaid converts. They were kind of like an, they were like an intern. So yes, by their own logic, they are slave owners, just like all white people are. And so I think this is something just to kind of get you thinking, right? Because if you find yourself having a lot of feelings about stuff, and, and you're not quite sure about where is that all coming from, right? Um, why is it so hard to, to unpack how you have internal, you know, implicit biases around racism, which, you know, we've all been taught growing up, right? And, and yet, so if you find yourself having a lot of feeling that's getting in the way of you processing that, of you being able to move into action to end, race, to end racism, even though you want to, right? So I want you to consider that there's a reason why that's happening. Right? And we're going to talk more about what those reasons are, but like that, that there's a reason why that's happening. And, and you're not right or wrong for that to be happening. It just is what's coming up, right? And it may not be your own trauma. It may be intergenerational trauma from the past, okay? So, so I want to talk a little bit about how whiteness was created. So a lot of us don't know this. And Oh, oh, whiteness, whiteness was, was created. Oh, that is priceless. Oh, my God. <laughs> White, wh whiteness is a social construct created in the early 19th century. Oh, my God. By wealthy, land-owning, northwestern elites, and I am assuming the, the descendants in Americas. So, what about... 18th century wealthy landowning northwestern Europeans that were white. Were they not white? Yeah, that, that's a... What about 19th century poor, didn't own any land, northwestern Europeans? You know, the exact opposite of the elites. Were they not white? And why is it that they are excused from the equation... But now, my family history is under the knife, is under the gun of, oh, well, your family was complacent with slavery, so you're now responsible for slavery. Yeah. When you're saying here that it was 19th century land-owning wealthy elites that created whites. And another thing that they inadvertently say here is, Slavery existed long before the 19th century, and if toxic whiteness is something that comes from white people owning slaves, well, then what about before the 19th century? Because slaves existed before the 19th century. It's, it's like they're saying history before the 19th century either doesn't exist or doesn't matter. And the goal was to pit non-wealthy people from other European countries against enslaved Africans and native folks so they wouldn't join forces against the ruling elite. 
Well, wouldn't non-wealthy people just be as victimized as Africans and Native folks? Yeah. That's actually what you're saying here, is that they also suffered under the abuse of the ruling elite. It was, you had actual slaves, and then you had indentured servants. More than that, you had poor people. You had slaves, you had indentured servants, and then you just had poor people. Yeah, who were somehow worse. Because indentured servants and slaves were at least taken care of. They were made sure that they had food because if your slave or your servant starved, they would just die. Now you've lost your workforce. But a poor person, who cares if they die? If they die, it's just another dead poor person. Right, we're not condoning the abuse that slaves had, no. but we are saying that at least, you know, they were somewhat taken care of versus a poor person who's not taken care of at all. Yeah, it's you have to supply your own means for existence because you're not owned by someone. It's you're just left out in the cold on your own and you've got to do it on your own while still owing everything to this person who owns the land that you happen to be living on. And I love this last part. Poor Europeans gained white privilege and lost their connection to their cultural heritage, to their history and awareness of their own struggles, and to their own humanity in relation to people of color. How did they do that? How did poor Europeans gain white privilege if white privilege was created by the wealthy land-owning elite? Because it would seem to suggest that only those who were wealthy elite and land-owning were part of this white privilege. How did white non elite wealthy landowners gain white privilege. You can't just say they gained it without telling us how they gained it. So let's see if they explain how these people gained white privilege. Because right at the beginning you're saying that they were as much as a victims as slaves, as Native Americans, as the Chinese workers, as anyone else. I mean, there. It, if you actually look at history of America, I mean, there are many incidents, incidences where, like, the whole gold rush, people were forced to work in very poor conditions, uh, forced to go into a mine that could collapse at any moment, and had to work, like, seven days a week just picking and maybe they might get time off to go to church, but you better believe they're back out there trying to find gold, trying to find silver. Yeah, it's like my great-grandfather on my mom's side was a coal miner in West Virginia, and he died in a coal mine accident. He was actually run over by a coal car. So, you know, what was this white privilege we had? The right to die? You know, yeah, maybe we might have had the right to have the job. Maybe, but it wasn't necessarily a step up from slavery. It basically was slavery. Yeah, there's the song, uh, Soldier Soul to the, the company, company Store. That's because these companies back then didn't pay you money. They paid you credits that you could only use at the company store. And you had to rent a pickaxe so you could work in the mine. You had to buy your food from the company so, so they, they were essentially, essentially paying you nothing and getting all of this free labor. Basically, yeah. You know, and this was displayed in the movie The Rundown. And yeah, we can believe how bad it was there because they're doing it to the native population. But it's the same thing. Yeah, you can make money, but, you know, you know getting a uh, tools costs you money, getting food, getting a room... It was also in Malcolm in the Middle, Francis, when he went up to Alaska. Same exact thing. He wasn't making money. He actually was running a tab just by being there. So any work that he did was paying off this money, and he couldn't get out of it so long as he owed money. It was slavery. 
I was amazed he was allowed to go home at all. Every day that goes by, the amount of money you owe the company continues to increase. And it's going up faster than you're making money for the work that you put in. So you literally sell your soul to the company store. They own you. And that is what poor white people did. So where was this white privilege that they had? Maybe they got treated a little bit better, okay. But that's not necessarily indicative of white privilege. Mm -mm. I don't know how they got treated better necessarily since they were working in impoverished conditions. Well, they lived in impoverished conditions. They worked in a very dangerous field and their employers didn't care one bit if they lived or died. They only cared if they um, worked, and if they didn't work, they could find someone to take their spot. Yeah, my great-grandfather, who died in a coal mine accident, died at 23 years old. Like, my grandmother never even knew what he looked like because she was just a baby when he died. 